Hey church, how are you all doing? This is Pastor Nathan. It is uh, time for our devotional for May 8th, and we're going to open to Acts chapter 17. But first, you have to try to guess where I am. If you guessed the choir loft, then you are right. I'm running out of interesting places to do these from. So this is what I'm looking out on right now. A big empty room. <laughs> so anyway, I like to mix things up a little bit. Some variety is good. Um, anyway, if you could open up your Bibles to Acts 17, that's what we're going to we're going to focus on today. Now, if you were, if you joined in yesterday, then you know that Acts chapter 17 is uh, the record of, or rather Acts 17 and what happens in Acts 17 is a part of which missionary journey of the Apostle Paul's? If you said the second, then you would be right. So Acts 16 and 17 are both part of his second missionary journey. Uh, he goes through Thessalonica in the early part of Acts chapter 17. You know this expression about the faithful Bereans who, whenever they heard something preached, they would run back to the Old Testament scriptures to see if these things were so. That happens as well in Acts 17. And then Paul goes to Athens and the text, let's see, it's verse 16, says that he was provoked when he saw that the city of Athens was given over to idols. This was... It was this is a, a godly zealotry, a godly zeal that the Apostle Paul had for the glory of God. So he's deeply disturbed and troubled in his being when he sees that Athens is, is full of these, uh, these false gods. Um, so let's look at a few verses starting in, uh, in, verse, in verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. No, don't miss that. This man seems to be a preacher of foreign deities or divinities. And Luke adds, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So what does that say about the early Christians' belief about Jesus' identity? That Jesus was a what? That Jesus was a deity. That he was divine. Verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. This is known as, as Mars Hill in the city of Athens. Saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. And Luke adds this. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. You know, the, the Bible tells us that it is a good thing to uh, engage in intellectual pursuits. That's a good thing for our minds to be filled with knowledge. It's a great thing for people to be curious and to seek to understand all that they can about God, especially, and also about God's world. But I think this verse 21 here points to, uh, maybe warns us against a particular intellectual curiosity that is fruitless. And I think that's really what was happening in, in Athens. They spent all their time doing nothing but, but hearing and telling uh, something, something new. We should take that as a caution and beware fruitless intellectual pursuits. Many intellectual pursuits are, are edifying. They are worth pursuing with as much energy as we can give to them. But there is such thing as fruitless intellectual pursuits. Uh, beware of those. So Paul stands up on the Areopagus, Mars Hill. Uh, I've had a chance to, to, to go to Mars Hill in uh, 2003. And I actually memorized this section of Acts 17. So I stood on the Areopagus and I... I preached this sermon of the Apostle Paul's, and um, uh, people looked at me weird, but I didn't really care, whatever, I'll never see them again. Um, it's a wonderful sermon. Listen to what Paul says. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, quote, to the unknown God, end quote. 
What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, that God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nature of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed, we are indeed his offspring. Then Paul says this in verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Notice what the Apostle Paul says, and there are implications of this in us uh, testifying to who Jesus is and speaking to people about Jesus. Um, God doesn't beg and plead and pretty please, you know, ask people to, um, to, uh, to honor his son, Jesus. No, God commands people to repent, to turn to his son, Jesus, right? So our God isn't kind of helpless and hoping that, you know, maybe somebody will like me and accept me. That's not the God of the Bible. God actually commands us to repent and we're, rebellious and we're disobedient when we refuse to do that. So keep that in mind. There's a command for people to repent in verse 30. And why is that? Because of verse 31, because he, that is God, the father has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Uh, the apostle Paul was the apostle par excellence of the deity of Christ. I mean, Paul writes about this extensively. And yet Paul also says that Jesus is a man and he's the man that God has appointed to judge the world. That's absolutely true. So there's a sense in which, or not a sense in which it is the case that Jesus, um, who is uh, uh, eternally fully God and fully man, will be the one who will judge the living and the dead. And, and Jesus will be able to judge all people, those who are alive and those who, who have died by virtue of the fact that he is a man, right? So it would be one thing if just God were, were giving the judgment. It's like, well, God, you can judge anybody and that's very easy. But the Apostle Paul, I think, highlights the fact that it is the man, Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead because Jesus has been where we are. He, he has sat in our seat. He has walked in our shoes, you know, whatever um, little cliches that you want to that you want to uh, to use, and the assurance that Jesus Christ really is the Judge of the world, and is appointed for that work, is that God the Father raised him from the dead. We can think of the resurrection of Jesus as a vindication of all of the things that Jesus claimed about himself. the The resurrection is God the Father's Amen to the ministry of His Son. Jesus Christ. Then it ends by saying, verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So the fruit was, was few as a result of this sermon that the apostle Paul preached in Athens on Mars Hill or the Areopagus. Yet there were some, there were some men and women who were compelled and convinced by what the apostle Paul said. And he did this in, in the center of intellectual creativity over all the world. I mean, Athens was known as a center for philosophy and thinking deep thoughts and things like that. Uh, so I, I commend any of you who are laboring in fields in which, uh, in intellectual fields, where you are um, are seeking to, to please God and to bring the reality of the knowledge of God to bear on your disciplines. It doesn't matter if you're a scientist, if you're in the business school, or if you're a, uh, some, some kind of an intellectual who's, uh, you know, a historian or 
uh, any area like that, those are very worthwhile pursuits. But I would urge you to, uh, to always keep first things first and remember that our calling as we engage in uh, those things that God has called us to is to seek him and his kingdom first and to always bring the knowledge of God to bear on our subject, either directly or, or indirectly um, as, God, as God leads us. Um, so there you have it, Acts 17. Uh, I have a quick, it's kind of a non-announcement, I guess you could say, uh, but I do want to update you very briefly that the uh, conjunction of the staff at church, the deacons and the elders, we are in the midst of formulating plans for how we might be able to reopen the church safely. Um, those plans are still being worked through, so I, we don't have anything yet, any dates or any protocols to announce yet, but I'm hoping that in the next week or so, we will be able to um, uh, uh, inform the congregation of the decisions that we have, have made. And in advance, I'll go ahead and tell you that we have people in all of these groups who some are leaning toward, let's go ahead and start back sooner than later, and others are... Um, are wanting us to to wait longer before we we reopen. So we have these spectrums amongst all of all of these groups, and uh, what we're going to try to do is come up with a plan that will be satisfactory to the majority of people, knowing that not everybody will be happy. Some people think we should have already returned to worship, and other people feel like we're not even close to being ready to return to worship. So um, so my my heart and my prayer and and, and the session feels the same way as well. Is that uh, is that we would just be so gracious with with one another as we um, move move into this period of consideration for how we can wisely and safely resume gathering for for the worship of God. So my prayer is that we would just be be gracious with one another as we uh, um, as we begin to to consider this question. So. Um, no more specifics for now, but um, God willing, I'll be able to announce something soon. So anyway, I wish you all well. And uh, as always, reach out if I can do anything to, to serve you. Okay. God bless. Bye-bye.